are doing a fantastic job promoting sport at school level, at the grassroots level. I would say that we are no less than boys. We are achieving so much in the last few years and a lot of girls have done great for the country. Over 600 schools, over 17,000 kids participating in 25 sports for one trophy. You know, sports and education can go hand in hand. We are not only trying to make champions, we are also trying to make holistic human beings. I am glad that you know there is some platform for the kids and for the teachers to interact with the parents. Means I think it's as good as the Olympic Games for me. I've never seen so much talent here and so much potential. So maybe the next you should board is from India. I was blown away at what SFA is doing for the community and for these children. I think SFA is doing a fantastic job to create a platform for children to really be the best that I can be in a sport that I am massively passionate for. So I think you guys are really lucky. I really hope you make full use of this opportunity, okay? Because we didn't get to us. Now we India. India. देने के सफर में हमेशा आपके साथ है हीरो अपनों को हंसाने के चल ढूंढ ले कुछ बहाने संग संग गुनगुनाने के चल ढूंढ ले कुछ बहाने मुस्कानों में उनकी मिले तुझको ये जहां खुशियों के रंगों से लिपटे फिर तेरा आसमां धीमे धीमे से बोले रास्ते ये अनजाने Believe we might be in a position to make a start. Yes, please, Sid. We can. Fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. So, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, hopefully, uh, you joined us for the inaugural session and uh, hopefully you found that valuable and there were some insights there which were useful. That said, of course, uh, we will begin our first panel discussion very shortly indeed. This particular panel is called uh, Esports, more than a recreational sport. And the premise of this particular panel, of course, is chronicling the journey of esports from its roots in recreation to where, of course, it is now, which is a very high potential, uh, very exciting growth structure within the wider sporting industry. We'd also talk about the inclusion of esports in the Asian Games and the Commonwealth Games, and we will discuss the impact of esports on the wider sporting landscape and the wider sporting ecosystem. Uh, we've got a list of stellar speakers lined up for yourselves. I will quickly go ahead and start introducing all of your panelists before I hand over to your moderator. So to begin with, we have Tith Mehta, who is an esports bronze medalist for India at the 2018 Asia Games. Alongside him, we have Lokmanyu Chaturvedi, who is a professional FIFA esports athlete for the Indian e-national team, as well as Two Rippers esports. We also have Mayank Prajapati, who is an esports athlete and will be representing India at the 2022 Asian Games. Uh, we also have Pyle Dhare, who is an esports athlete, also known as Pyle Gaming. She started a YouTube career as a streamer in 2020 with PUBG Mobile and has since garnered millions of subscribers on her YouTube channel. We also have Animesh Agarwal, also known as uh, 8-Bit Thug. He is the founder and CEO of 8-Bit Creatives. He's also the founder of Soul, which is a hub of gaming content and esports. Alongside themselves, we have Cohen Schobbers, who is a member of the board of the Global Esports Federation and has worked with a number of organizations, including Spinning Records, Populous, 
Kia Motors, and Vodafone. Cohen's also the founder of Parents to Play, which is an initiative that helps parents and professionals repair, retain, or reinforce the relationships with gaming children. And finally, rounding off the panel, we have Sylvia Gattoni, also known as the Queen Arrow. Sylvia is a Kenyan esports athlete and content creator currently signed to American esports team UYU as a Tekken player. She was also recently named in the Forbes 2022 30 under 30 list for Africa. And finally, moderating this particular panel is Nishant Patel. He is the co-founder and CEO of AFK Gaming, and also both a former pro gamer and a Dota 2 commentator. So with that out of the way, Nishant, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sid. And I'm really happy and excited to be alongside such a prestigious panel here to discuss the future of esports as well as esports stepping out of uh, its shell as sort of a recreational activity. Um, to start with, right, let's begin with the most basic discussion of what exactly is esports. Um, we're all familiar with the fact that it is video games and competitive video games played by professional gamers. But when you go one level deeper, you realize that there's two sides to esports. There's the competitive side of it, and then there's the content creation side of it. Um, given that we've got a very diverse panel with, you know, experience across the spectrum, I'd like to start with Lokmanyu and Mayank here. Um, Guys, tell me what competition has been like in India for you guys. What does the esports ecosystem in India in, in India look like from your perspective? So I started my journey, uh, Street Fighter journey, professional Street Fighter journey back in 2016. And that's when I uh, basically won my first tournament. And let me tell you, the price spot for that tournament was around 5,000 rupees. So... At that particular time, the tournaments were not happening and the prize spots were pretty small. But coming, coming to 2022, the last tournament that I won was uh, the DreamHack 2019. And uh, the tournament prize spot for that uh, it was around 1 lakh rupees. So you can see the jump uh, in between the tournament prize spots. And uh, from that time, uh, all the all the esports organizations were doing a really a tremendous job of uh, basically organizing tournaments and uh, uh, telling everyone about the tournament. And a lot of people from that time uh, till now have joined uh, the the game that I that I'm playing right now. So it's been pretty good. Thank you so much, uh, my uncle. Look, man, you, I think you might have had a very similar journey, you know, having gone to FIFA Esports as your game of choice. Can you tell us what your experience has been like and what does the Indian Esports landscape look like from your perspective? Yeah, hi, Nishan. Thank you so much for having me. First of all, good morning to everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to share my journey with yours. So um, to answer your question, I think yes, and to agree with my uncle on this um, in this case as well, that earlier the price spots for all these tournaments were bare minimum. It was 5,000, 10,000. But the best part about it was FIFA being uh, being a sport that is the most followed sport in the world. Um, it had uh, around 500 people register for one particular tournament in New Delhi itself, for example. This was when Gaming Monk, one of the organizations, were doing a lot of tournaments earlier. This is back in 2017. So you can see the kind of people who were uh, trying to compete, who wanted to make a name for themselves um, for just a price pool of 10, 20,000. And uh, turn back to like, just uh, fast forward to 2022 and we have uh, participation in the Asian games. I got the chance to represent the national team last year. I'm getting the chance to represent them uh, this year as well. And it's become more structured. There's a domestic league coming in now. So I think everyone coming into the into the scene ha will have it much, I don't want to use the word easier, but they'll have it more structured. They'll have mentors. They will have coaches. They're going to have managers to guide them as to how to enter the space uh, in comparison to how esports athletes started off back in 2017 uh, in my case. And probably, you know, we can go even far back for, for the ones who started earlier. Thank you, Lokmanu. I'm going to double click on some of the stuff you said because those are interesting conversation points that I do want to bring up later on. Um, Tiff, you've represented India at possibly one of the highest stages that you know the world has to offer when it comes to sports and traditional sports as well. What was your journey like? What's your experience been like? And you know, tell us a little more about what it's like being a competitive card gamer uh, in India. Yeah, so being a competitive card gamer, I mean, uh, it you know like 
makes me surprised to see that so many participants were even entering these tournaments as Lokman you mentioned right like 500 registrants for example but uh, the card gamers our community is like relatively smaller compared to that right? like we usually see anywhere between like 30 to 64 uh, players participating in these tournaments uh, but even then i would say that the field of competition is really tough when it even comes to the indian scene right now uh, like we have many top tier competitors now who have entered the scene after the uh, after the sport being a part of asian games in 2018 and uh, uh, when I talk about my journey, I started in 2014, I started competing in Hearthstone. Uh, and uh, since then, I've competed in many of these uh, events and the most uh, noticeable one being the Asian Games. And uh, like, I would like to just echo that, you know, uh, when, when we think about esports, we think that it's just about uh, these tournaments of uh, uh, you know esports or video games, but it's much more than that, right? Like I would say that half the game is fought before even the before you even sit on this uh, gaming chairs i would say like the amount of preparation it takes the amount of uh, mental practice mental coaching mental fortitude it takes to compete in esports is i would say uh, on parallel with uh, any of the other physical sports activity we have seen and uh, when i when we explain when i was in asian games 2018 athletes village I, when we talked to other fellow sports athletes, uh, you know, they echoed this sentiment as well that uh, reaching to a sport to represent India, whether it's uh, in a sports activity or an esports activity, it, it takes like the same amount of effort. So uh, I just like to say that, you know, the fact that uh, now it is being recognized as a proper uh, athletic event uh, and being a part of uh, medal events in the upcoming Asian Games, uh, I would say that uh, as Lokman, you mentioned, the journey for uh, up and coming esports players will be a lot more accessible and open, I would say. Yeah, I think uh, that's a sentiment that most of us on this panel would share. Uh, I'd like to take this conversation to the other side of the world now. Sylvia, tell us what your experience has been like with esports on the global stage. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel to talk about my personal experiences. Um, so my professional journey began in 2017. Um, I first started with uh, Mortal Kombat and initially I just joined the, uh, the tournament because I thought it was just a fun thing to do. But with my high placing at fourth place, I realized that it was something that I could actually like seriously get into. Um, Though there wasn't much of a structure in Kenya at the time for esports, and there's not, you know, there's not really much of that conversation going on. Um, in 2018, I decided to transition to Tekken, and I, uh, and that year is when I got signed to my first esports team. It was known as Exit Gaming. Uh, they were based in the United States, and that's now really started getting the conversation around esports going here in Kenya. Um, I actually started competing like outside of the country. Last year, I got the chance to uh, travel to South Africa and France, courtesy of Red Bull and the French government uh, for the last uh, for, for my participation in the event in France. And that's where I actually got a feel of how it uh, was in competing on the international stage. And, you know, it's a different kind of environment. Uh, there's more scrutiny and more... I'd say uh, more that is required of you. Uh, this year, I got to participate in the Kanoki Sports Series in Guadeloupe. Um, I placed fifth in the mixed tournament, and I won the best female uh, in the in the women's event. And I think, um, as my other panelists have said, that um, it's not easy, especially if the um, we're, if especially we're in the African region. Esports is still a very niche and fledgling sp space, and you know, we are the pioneers of this space and we're the ones who are kind of charting the path of how it's supposed to, how it's supposed to be like, how we're supposed to uh, be represented, how we're supposed to compete. And, you know, it's the later gener generations that are going to have an easier time of accessing this space and knowing what is required of them at the highest level. And it's, uh, and I honestly feel that those of us who've actually had the chance to get as far as we have in uh, in this space, the ones were supposed to pay it forward by, you know, by giving our, our resources, our time, and our skills to, you know, to, 
uh, to this space and making sure that you know the future gen generations have guides and mentors so they don't make the same mistakes that we did uh, when we were coming up. Well said, Sylvia. And on that note, I'd like to transition to Animesh. Animesh, you've been a mentor to many in the ecosystem. You, you've been uh, you know, a mentor to both professional players as well as content creators. Do you feel like this is an integral part of what's going to help esports turn into a, a, you know, more than just a pastime activity within India and across the world? Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, like it's already become more than just a pastime. Uh, like, you know, if you've seen the journey, or if you've seen my journey and the journey of entire eight beaten as it will create us and the esports player. I mean, like we have had players who started in 2019 and 2018 are still sticking to the esports side and also the content side. I strongly believe that, uh, you know, uh, just reiterating what Tirith and Lokman, you said, that it's not, it's like as good as traditional sports where you have everything going on with uh, training professional uh, mentors and everything. So I definitely believe that we have, uh, like, you know, people have already started realizing that, you know, whenever I meet uh, a new uh, child on the blog, they are always like, I want to get into esports. Like, they just, they just don't want to do casual gaming. That's the biggest change that we have seen. There could be people who are still uh, heavily invested into casual gaming, but when you meet kids on blog, when you meet our fans, it's been more like people wanting to get into esports, people wanting to play into tournaments, people wanting to represent the country. I think that's the biggest change transition that I've seen post-COVID uh, period when we had a plethora of tournaments coming in and, you know, with the in increase of the number of third-party tournaments that have been ha happening over the last two years. I believe that this is definitely the present and as well as the future. I mean, like every uh, family uh, needs to now realize that if there's a gamer in the house, then they do have a ready-made career for which they need to have a special training, a special facility set up. However, I would say we are still a little bit uh, away from when we could have like every nook and corner of the country having the proper infrastructure set up required to set up uh, esports player. However, we are still on their way. Like we started 10 years late than other our counterparts. So I think it's absolutely fine that uh, like we are still had a bigger boom than they had over the last three years, to be honest. Awesome. Uh, Pyle, I'd like to hear a little bit about what the content creation side of esports looks like. You started off as, you know, someone playing games for your fans just for fun. And then eventually you transitioned into one of the most watched female streamers in India. What has the journey been like? And, you know, how is that different from the life of a competitive gamer? I'm sorry, Payal, we can't hear you. No, we still can't hear you. All right, let me get back to you, Payal. Let me circle back to you as you fix your issues. Um, there's, there's a powerful statement that, you know, a lot of us have heard. I personally am considered a dinosaur in esports because of my age now. But I'd love to hear, you know, perspectives on the terms gaming is a waste of time, right? We've heard this way too often from parents, peers, family, friends. It's a stigma that's been hard to shake off, but we're seeing it shake, shaken off now thanks to, the, thanks to efforts from people like Animesh, Lokman, Yumayank, and Payal, right? Um, I'd love to hear more about Cohen's thoughts on this. You know, if, without giving you any prompts, I'd love to hear what the initial reaction is when someone tells you gaming is a waste of time. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nishan, and thank you also for the invitation to uh, to speak during this panel. Now, my opinion is, uh, is is relatively simple. So when I started, I feel a little bit old school because I started in 2006, which is like 16 years ago. I started as a professional gamer in 2007, all the way to 2018, and I've I've been there in the time where you know stigma was at least in the Netherlands because that's where I'm from, and also in Europe in general because those were the countries I was traveling to as an esports player in Trackmania, which is a racing game. Um, I encountered a lot of stigma and, uh, uh, you know, bullying at, at, at high school was like the normal thing back in the day, like, oh, you're a pro gamer, you know, you should spend time studying, doing sports and all the other things, which of course is important because balance in general is important between sleep, social life, study, sports and playing the games, of course, like screen time. Uh, but I did notice a, a transition in time that at the beginning, people would put you inside like this box, like, oh, you're a gamer. So you're like that, that type of person. Um, and eventually with the industry growing, getting more media coverage, getting bigger events, uh, more, more audiences, different age groups, uh, considering the audience as well. Even my grandma is playing games for her mental as well, which is a thing. Uh, the healthcare industry is making use of VR and gaming for different uh, healthcare situations. So it's actually getting more coverage nowadays. And what I notice is that instead of putting people in a box, there is a, they, they, they start to ask questions. So if you say, I work in this industry, I'm doing different things, the general uh, 
uh, feeling I get is instead of putting the, you in the box, they start to ask questions. Okay, so what do you do? How does it work? Okay, how big is that industry? And then eventually they will Google themselves and they will figure out a couple of things more. And then they can decide if it's if this industry is something they find interesting or not. Because in the end, not everyone likes tennis, not everyone likes football, not everyone likes esports or gaming. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, the only thing I don't like is when people have a very strong opinion or very strong stigma about people or a certain industry without knowing anything about the industry. So I think that's a big change in time that nowadays we get a lot more questions, a lot more conversations. And I, th I have the feeling the industry can explain itself to people outside the industry, which of course benefits the growth uh, in all different spaces. Awesome. Before we jump forward, I'd like to circle back to Payal. Are you back online? Uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me now. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. I thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. And as you said that the country is witnessing more and more female esports players as well as the content creators, as you can see. And I, I have been streaming for the past two years. So for uh, I, if I can say the margin for content creators, it is less than the esports e players. People are more interested into esports gaming and the females are also emerging into the scene. They are also showing their interest towards the esports scene in India. And as if I talk about uh, content creation only, so our org SATL contains to remain the most uh, popular domestic org, signing up top range of content creators as well as esports player also. And the, um, they have achieved more success in the content creation and marketing compared to its run in past few years. And I can see there is a more scope in esports for our country because it is so, uh, so much popular uh, among the young generation because of the accessibility of mobile phone, internet and everything. And after the COVID scene, it is more uh, interesting, uh, I think, platform for the young generation because everyone can access uh, the mobile phones and internet is way uh, cheap for them to consume. Uh, if, we, if we talk about PC gaming, it is a bit difficult, but India is also emerging into that also. Uh, as if we can see the Valorant uh, scene in India, it is also emerging. Like if you talk about VCC and other competition, which has happened uh, recently. Got it. So jumping back to Cohen's statement, right? About uh, how esports is essentially it could be a force for good. Gaming could be a force for good if channeled in the right way. I'd like to, you know, draw some parallels here between sports and esports. Cohen, you mentioned that you'd been bullied a lot, you know, in, in your school days for being an esports, you know, aficionado. But at the same time, there are so many similarities between esports and traditional sports. Could you shed some light on those? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, like the, the first few years of high school were not the greatest, uh, let's say. But, you know, things happen in the end. The bullies are now following your story and everyone is engaging with your posts online. But uh, a couple of similarities. Now, when I look at my professional career and I think a couple of others, especially Thierth uh, Merta uh, uh, mentioned it very well, I believe, is that as an esports player, you're not just sitting on your chair in front of the screen um, playing your video games on a professional level, we should say, of course. Like on a professional level, there's many different coaches supporting you as a player to be on that level, stay on that level and improve on that level, including fitness coaches, nutritionists, psychologists. Uh, I know that uh, Team Liquid is uh, having their own like sports center, let's say inside the building in Utrecht here in the Netherlands in their headquarters. Um, so it's, it's a lot more than just playing a game. And I think a couple of other similarities is still that um, besides the fact that the professionals have to perform on a high level besides their game, so analytically, uh, physically doing their sports in order to be able to perform on that level, um, they also have to, as just mentioned, analyze, just like any soccer player, before the match, you're with a team, you're going to analyze what's the plan, what is the strategy, how are we going to react to certain situations. It's a team game, so, you know, a lot of communication, many sports are team-based as well. I mean, even if you're a tennis player and you're by yourself on the field, you still have a team of coaches and professionals behind your back that are supporting you to even be able to stand on the sand or the grass on the tennis field. So, I think... Looking at what sports is and looking at the growth of esports, there are um, more and more similarities on a, let's say, professional level where the professionals nowadays have those teams around them in order to perform on a pro level. But I think there is um, a lot of gain still on more like the casual side of things, uh, especially in the Netherlands. It's a popular topic that recently, I think last week, 
I was at a uh, attending a conference where the topic was um, connection through sport, and all the people there were people from the sports industry in the Netherlands. And the main topic was how can we connect with the youth? We can't reach the younger generation. We have lower amounts of uh, subscriptions at the local clubs. Uh, we have uh, problems with inactivity. However, you know, like gaming is of course maybe partly responsible, but definitely not only responsible. But it's one of those things that they're talking about locally. And I think that's one of the, the bigger differences. Like for this industry, it's very easy to connect with the younger audience. Uh, they grow up with what Payal said, the internet uh, around them, smartphones around them, very easy, accessible, easy to go online. Um, but I think traditional sports have, have a little bit more, more problems to reach that audience the same way. They have a, a lot to learn. Right. So Animesh, I'd like to take some of these topics to, from your perspective, right? Um, we've talked about having this, this stigma towards esports and towards gaming in, in, in across the world, right? It's not just an India problem as we've learned today. Um, how has this journey been for you? Because you are one of the success stories that a lot of people state when they're trying to convince their parents to let them get into this industry. What was that journey like for you? And, and also, what would you, what would you tell someone that's looking to get into the gaming esports industry, right? See, right, so I'll start here with my journey. Uh, like, you know, if you, I started gaming, casual gaming around 2016 with a game called Clash Royale. I was like, uh, like it was a purely uh, time pass for me because I was uh, deep down, like my feet deep down into studies. I was pursuing my CA and CF and FRM. So, and then uh, it was around 2018 when I cleared my uh, like CA uh, inters and then I also cleared some levels of CF and FRM. And that's why I decided to take a break. Uh, so, you know, at that juncture, when I decided to take a break from academics was the only reason was being was I was well set, like I was, I had a good backup, I had a good place to fall back if in case things don't work out. So here I want to reiterate the importance of education or whatever is your, uh, you know, alternate career choice. I would say uh, the stigma attached is only because if someone right now in India, if, a, uh, if someone goes to their parents and say, I want to pursue only gaming when they are maybe 16 or 17, I would say it's a good choice, but it cannot be your only career option because we are still yet to be there. I mean, like, uh, this is the case with everywhere. You cannot just start, uh, you know, like, you leave your study, especially in a country like India, where majority of the population comes from middle class. You know, there are so many obligations on the child uh, as they grow up. Uh, it's not, the culture is very different out here. So I think uh, it's all about having an alternate career choice uh, and, you know, gaining the trust of your parents. As you grow as a child, I think the big, most important part is how much your parents trust you to give you that chance to do something of yourself. That's a problem we have inherent in India. So in my case, it was like, because I did, I was, uh, doing pretty well in my academics, I had a very good uh, reason to take a you know break and ask my parents for a chance to do something in gaming. I think that was that that is why my route looks very easier that I was able to convince my parents. But no one sees that I started pretty late. I got into hardcore gaming when I was twenty one. So and that's when like you know people think and now people think that I want to get start when I'm fourteen when I'm fifteen. The kind of kids that I meet uh, these days. So I would say the stigma is attached only because uh, you know of the choices that you're trying to make. However, I started in twenty one and then I started as a streamer as well as a professional player. I was the first person to represent India uh, globally in PUBG Mobile for PMSA twenty eighteen. But when I came back, I realized that the opportunity is too big and I'm a player too bad. So I think I need to give other people a chance and maybe I could be if not me then who else? Because no one has no one. Has Actually got a chance except for the eight of us who represent India to get a first hand uh, experience of how uh, you know an esports tournament of that level could look like. Uh, some get fascinated. I, I was one of them who got really fascinated and thought that okay, if it's not me, but at least there should be people who uh, get a chance from India to uh, keep visiting these tournaments uh, every time uh, this happened. So I came back, I established 8bit as a better team. I partnered up with Mortal to start up Soul, and then eventually merged SATL and Rest is History. Yeah, but the journey, I think, you know, the long story short, the stigma is attached only when uh, you try to uh, take these decisions to switch your career completely into gaming. I would always reiterate the importance of uh, education or a backup plan. Because I would like, you know, Mishan, me and you, we have seen so many people struggle, so many people still not uh, able to, you know, make it uh, as big as some of us do. So I think that's a very big reason everyone should, uh, you know, not look at just the top uh, one person, not even one person, maybe the top 0.1%, rather focus on the 98.9, who are great, but still struggling. So I think that, uh, you know, it's always great to have an alternate career option. If you have that, there won't be any stigma attached. I mean, like, I think that's only because people think that if you start gaming at a very young age, you might not have a place to fall back in your career is done. So I think uh, everyone who's trying to enter esports or gaming as a full-time career just needs to balance out stuff uh, in their career. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with your animation. And, you know, 
to add to your point, I feel like having some alternate skill sets outside of the gaming world also lets you do better within the gaming world itself. In your case, it's finance. In Sylvia's case, it's, it's a legal background. And then, you know, everybody here has, has a secondary superpower that they won't really talk much about in gaming interviews, but they're absolutely vital to them progress, progressing in this right. industry. Um, Sylvia, would you share a similar sentiment as Animesh about, um, you know, having an alternate career path while pursuing gaming? And how has that journey been like for you, you know, from peers, from family, from friends? Uh, yeah, I can say a lot of my own experience with Animesh's own experiences. Um, outside of school, I'm actually a law student. I'm pursuing my postgraduate diploma at the Kenya School of Law. Uh, it's going to allow me to be admitted to the bar once I pass my bar exams. Um, yeah, you see the sentiment here in Kenya is, you know, as I said, esports is still a very, very niche, uh, I'd say, uh, ecosystem, not just here in Kenya, but within the African region. So um, a lot of the laws on the books, you know, um, such as the Betting and Notaries Act of 1966, for example, it state, you know, it uh, kind of puts gaming as you know similar to gambling. So if you're going to if you're going to talk to someone um, in, who doesn't know anything about gaming or esports or to the older generation, the moment you say the word gaming, they'll be like, "Hey, aren't you gambling or something?" You know, there's that if, uh, sometimes even a very hostile reaction, and. With, for my own parents, they actually thought that I was, you know, partaking in gambling when I first said that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doing gaming on the side outside of school. And, um, you know, they were actually super reluctant for me to partake within gaming and esports. And honestly, with good reason, I don't to be the person to clown on the older generation for having some of these reservations. And some of them uh, have, you know, they have good reasons too. Um, for a lot of our parents, you know, uh, they are, you know, they are the generation that uh, came up after, you know, uh, experiences of colonialism, and a lot of them grew up in poverty. And then the only way they knew how to escape poverty was having a good education. So you see, when they see that their kids are going into alternate and very niche uh, careers, you know, they they are scared. You know, they'll make, you know, they're going to ruin their life. They're going to mess up. And you know they don't you know they may not come back from that. So I don't and I don't think uh, any parent wants ill for their children. So they have every reason to be concerned. And you know I feel that they have every right to guide their children and you know at least ask questions of them. Do you have a backup plan in case this doesn't work out? And anyone who comes to me and asking how they can get into esports, I also I also emphasize you need to have a good education, have that backup plan in case things don't work out for you. And there's so many ways you can contribute to the wider ecosystems outside of being a professional player. You can get into, you know, as Animesh has a, you know, he has a finance background, I have a legal background. We still need people in marketing. We still need people who know how to make good policies that are going to help the wider ecosystem thrive. We need coaches, you know, there's so many ways that your traditional degree can work in the esports e ecosystem without having to be a professional player. So, you know, there's a bit, for lack of a better phrase, there's a bigger cake for everyone involved. So, yes, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to deny the older generation their, you know, their laurels. You know, they have the experience, they've seen how the world can be. And, you know, if, uh, as long as they don't also deny us that chance to try and, you know, make things work with the ecosystem, um, you know, I, I'm all for them contributing to this space. Got it. Um, my uncle, I'd like to come to you here, right? Um, similar story with you. You've actually, you've actually been representing India at the Asian Games 2022, but you're also a freelance visualize, architecture visualizer slash designer. Tell us more about what those two lives look like. How do you separate them and how, you know, is there ever an overlap between one or the other? So, yeah, uh, I've been an uh, interior designer and visualizer from the last uh, 10, 12 years. And that's because... Uh, despite being uh, a professional player, I don't get to play in a lot of tournaments. And as I said, that the price spot is currently increasing, but uh, the time when I used to play, it was not that good. And specifically, if I talk about uh, esports as a career, I, I don't think right now, uh, for me, it's uh, pretty sustainable because uh, there's not a lot of tournament happening, at least for my games, because Street Fighter and Tekken, uh, they they still don't have a lot of audience in India. 
and uh, as a as a professional player i need a lot of tournaments and i need to win those tournament to basically earn a good living and trust me when i say this that winning a tournament is not that easy because we have a lot of talent and our community is really small and i mostly know a lot of players here and if you com- talk about the international scene we can definitely compete over there and that's why the the competition level is really high and winning a tournament takes a lot of practice and and a lot of time so uh, my main career right now is not uh, is not uh, focused uh, around esports and is not focused around uh, winning tournaments and also i do have a backup that uh, that in case my esports journey doesn't go well so i can always rely on my on my main source of income so that's uh, when i uh, uh that's when i talk about uh, my main source of income is uh, something else yeah got it so this we we've, we've actually got both sides of the spectrum here right on one side you've got gamers like animesh payal that have managed to go full time here because you know the audience is large enough in in the titles that they compete in and play in um and then mayank and, and, and i believe even lokman you know they operate in smaller communities where it may not be feasible to entirely dive into this right from the get go lokman you do you feel like you know events like the asian games with uh, multiple game titles not necessarily chosen on the basis of popularity uh, do you think these serve as as a, as a sort of solution to this problem in the long term so i th- i think i'm a i'm a believer uh, that's that's a, i've always been that person right from the start like right ever since i entered the co- competitive scene i always uh, spoke about balance uh, like cohen said and like uh, animesh also mentioned i think what we are lacking from my personal opinion is the the balance basically we put too much focus on one thing in especially in india that's why the europeans are a little ahead of us like animesh mentioned that we're 10 years behind uh, i think the reason for that is uh, if we start young if we put a balance out to every uh, person who wants to become a competitive player not to skip their classes not to skip their fitness uh, routine not to skip their social life and then still be able to practice in a competitive environment i think once they have that balance um, all the solutions will will start coming out because if you focus too much on one thing then we start considering the backup plan and we start you know considering giving up on your passion and falling back to the life that you never really wanted to go back to uh, because yeah you came into the gaming space because that's that's your passion you wanted to make a name for the for yourself so I, i think once that balance comes in more tournaments are going to come in uh, with re- regards to your question specifically regarding the asian games i think more tournaments at the domestic level is needed just like in sport as well i have played football at the national level as well i've seen the struggles uh, with respect to the lack of grassroots level uh, that is required in the sports space as well now because yeah like going back again i'm going to keep circling back to that point again once the grassroots level is there the balance is eventually going to come uh for all the athletes because i'm 26 right now i started off professionally when i was 22 and that's really late for me to do that but um if i could get this opportunity this stage the asian games the uh, e indian super league that was introduced this year and all the tournaments that officially come i think uh, that is the right platform going forward if you have the right balance uh, especially relating to what cohen and animesh said got it tiff to expand upon this point right if if you're pursuing esports as a a side gig until you can make it your full time career is this something that anybody can do or do you think a person has to have inherent traits before they can say you know i'm on the journey to becoming a professional esports athlete full time so i would say it largely depends on the esport game or title you have chosen right like we've seen that there are many uh titles that uh, have very decent prize pool even in india uh, when it comes to uh, tournaments but uh, again like maya and glockman you would agree with me that some of the other titles such as for example the game that i play hearthstone uh, have i think so far have only had like two tournaments that were specifically for a uh, indian audience and uh, the prize pool of them weren't too large as well right so these issues are still there but i think like all of this will hopefully be sold uh and i w- i would say it's already starting to sold like i already seen more interest in uh, you know some organizations looking to organize this uh, tournaments for other games as well so i would say it's already improving and one of the solutions could be to have a better information outlet you know 
Um, uh, again, I would like to uh, bounce back to the point that uh, Silvia mentioned about gaming being mixed up with gambling or uh, other uh, you know activities that don't really relate to esports in any way. Uh, I would say that having a better information outlet, you know, informing this older generations and even the newer generations about what is actually esports and uh, uh, you know making them acquainted with the fact that esports can be a legitimate career that requires skills and uh, uh, specific traits. Uh, I think that can solve uh, this issue down the line. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, federations such as ESFI and panels such as this are part of uh, that stepping stone that we are going through here. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure that, uh, again, I would also like to bounce back on the uh, what Animesh mentioned about having a backup education, you know, like regardless if uh, you are pursuing esports as your uh, only source of income or, or only choice of career, from a young age, I think it's still like, uh, I think it will require you being in, you know, the top percentile of players to uh, net anything significant out of it to, you know, be financially stable from it. So in the end, like, of course, it's always good to have a backup, but uh, esports, when we talk about esports, you know, it's not just about competing. There are many other uh, parts of esports as well. Like uh, if you have, uh, like, for example, good communication skills, if you have other uh, specific, uh, as you mentioned, superpowers, uh, you can easily make a space for yourself in uh, in this field as well. So when you talk about esports, like it's also important to, you know, look at the esports as a whole field and not just about uh, the competition part of it. Right. And on that note, Cohen, I'd love to hear more about the role of federations towards developing esports and developing sustainable career paths for esports athletes like Tilth, my uncle, Lokmanu and Sylvia. Yeah, so uh, great question, because that's actually what we're working on uh, as well. So for us, the values and the norms that we have are very important, like, for example, diversity, equality, fair play, inclusivity, you know, all, all sorts of values and norms that for us are very important. And, you know, there's always the question between we have the gamers that want to become professionals and you have the professionals that want to probably continue working in the industry, but they might not have an idea where the positions are, how to get there. And that's also a little bit where we can learn from traditional sports, because in the Netherlands, for example, we have the Johan Cruyff Institute and professional sports players, traditional sports players that basically stopped their career can have an education there for one year and eventually they'll they'll have a job somewhere and they can make use of their athlete skills in the job they're doing. Uh, and I think that's very relevant. And also because this industry is still growing, I do notice a lot of positions opening. However, if you follow the news in the last week, we saw a lot of uh, layoffs as well, unfortunately. And, you know, that has to do with uh, the global economic system, undoubtedly, uh, as well. Uh, but currently, from the Global Esports Federation perspective, we are working on um, an, 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 like an academy, like making sure that if players want to get uh, some education or some form of backup in order to eventually work in this industry, that we have the, the, the opportunity for them to, to at least educate themselves into a certain direction and hopefully get a position there. Of course, we also have a very big global network. So in case there's someone also listening or watching maybe and is interested in working in this space, feel free to write us uh, to the secretariat or me personally as well. The emails are all online on the website as well. Uh, and there's always ways for us to connect people with other people because we have by now 180 member federations. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's many different opportunities, but I do see the industry growing, um, even though the layoffs are, are there in the past, uh, past week. Um, I think it's a, an industry to stay in and to grow as well. And we need people to fill up the spaces. And I think what Sylvia, I believe, said very correctly is... It doesn't matter what your background is, if it's law, if it's medicine, which is my background, uh, if it's anything else, uh, maybe uh, math, maybe marketing. Maybe. We need those people in the industry anyway, because just like any other industry, all those positions are very relevant. Like an esports team might need a physiotherapist you know, studying, studying the body, but they also need law because of all the rights with the contracts and stuff. So we need those people. So even though you want to work in this industry, you don't have to immediately think, oh, I'm going to work as a player or an influencer, like the most searched topics of, or, or like kids. What do you want to be? I want to be a pro gamer or an influencer. Um, but I think it's very important to also teach them that you don't have to be one of these two in order to work in this industry. You can be 
all the other things as well in order to work in this industry. And I think that's important to acknowledge and teach them as well, also from a federation point of view. Definitely. I think we could all do with a few more lawyers, doctors, accountants, and marketers within the esports realm as well. Um, just simply having domain expertise within esports does not guarantee you a spot within esports. I think that's the underlying message over here. Pyle, really quickly, jumping to you here, right? Um, let's let's try and take this conversation a few years into the future. What does the future of esports and gaming look like in India, both from a technological standpoint and from you know an audience and an ecosystem standpoint currently? Um. Let's talk about the COVID scenes. When COVID-19 halted traditional sports events in India, the esports gaming and industry quickly pivoted and offered virtual entertainment. And uh, with uh, entire population staying home, online viewership has skyrocketed. The credit for the majorly goes to the rise in young population, increased use of uh, smartphones, internet, and uh, the technology and internet, using investment by capitalists uh, and the appropriate distribution of network, the publishers like Garina, Riot, and Crafton, etc. are actively involved in investing and growing esports in India. Here's how the year fared from the platform organization and brands, their upcoming plans for like, if you talk about 2022, uh, there's an event going on by the Nordwin Gaming, which is the first live event on TV uh, that is going on South Sports. So, among the world's leading esports companies, uh, they are also investing a lot of amount uh, in esports scenes. And as we talk about uh, Animesh, he was into pro gaming scenes. Now he shifted to um, uh, managing a agency or he's co-founder of our 8-bit creatives. So there are so many other scopes rather than uh, only playing uh, online or uh, only streaming or being an esports uh, competitive player. So there are so many other options in esports. And if you talk about the upcoming scenes of esports in India, I personally want a dedicated uh, esport uh, competition or events for women also, because there are so many girls who are interested in competitive scenes and esports. So I personally want a dedicated scene for the, them also. And uh, yeah, it's emerging and India is growing rapid, rapidly in this scene. So I'm looking forward for more and more competitions and investment by the investors and other things. Fantastic. What about from a technological perspective? Does anyone have any, you know, we're just crystal gazing over here. Does anyone have any predictions for what esports looks like? Is it going to be played on different platforms? Is it going to be, are we going to continue to see it played on mobile devices? Where are we going next with esports? I think both PC and mobile, but uh, for now, mobile users are more than PC because uh, everyone having smartphone and it is more cheaper than the having a big PC setup. And for esports scene, you need a, a well uh, customized PC that costs above a lakh or more than that. So for now, mobile gaming is more like we have uh, millions of users who play on mobile. So I can see the growth of mobile esports more than the PC scenes. Right. Animesh, you wanted to add something over there? Yeah, you know, technological standpoint, I think 5G is going to be the next big game changer. We had Geo coming in, which I think paved the way for a lot of people uh, you know, having accessibility to internet, social life, and eventually gaming. So I think uh, with 5G coming in, I was just, uh, you know, I just got a chance last uh, this year in March to experience Airtel 5G first. And I think with the kind of uh, technology they are coming up, although it's going to benefit, like the government gives a quit, it's going to come out in face faces. But if 4G was the revolution, 5G is going to be the real game changer for gaming scene altogether. Uh, but yeah, I believe that uh, more infrastructure means like, you know, I mean, in urban cities, we don't really have too much of infrastructure related problems, technology uh, from a technology standpoint. But I think still, if you look at every other uh, hook and corner of the world, I mean, like we still need to have boot camps only for one simple reason, that's internet. So like, you know, that's a, I think that's a major uh, problem or hiccup that I could say uh, that's going to stay for gaming. But uh, once that's sorted and, you know, once and obviously with more platforms and all uh, you know, in Indian platforms like local coming up and more gaming platforms more tournament platforms coming up i believe that we are on a correct path to have uh, good games uh, with also the developers uh, including and developers uh, development studios coming up so much of investment coming in i think technological standpoint say we are on the correct path 
but 5g would be the real game changer if uh, you know it's uh, pan india like i mean like right now what i see is that majority of the talent that we are being able to take is coming majorly from the tier 1 tier 2 cities but i see a lot of but i'm pretty sure that a lot of allies in tier 3 for tier 3 and tier 4 cities where we aren't able to reach yet cause those people are technologically very behind because of the lack of infrastructure so i believe that is a hiccup and that could be a hiccup to the future cause like uh, you know everyone mentioned grassroots level i believe that is also a real grassroots level uh, of reaching out to every nook and corner of the country uh, because the future cannot lie rely only on just the top two tier cities i think it definitely needs to be uh, to every uh, town every city every village i think so that is something that we need to definitely work on and i guess i mean like mobile gaming like pile uh, mentioned has all has been the way to go in india uh, definitely because of the affordability uh, you know it's better for mobile devices but uh, Uh, to be honest i see that there is a uh, strong transition happening towards pc gaming as well with uh, maybe i could say parents may be realizing more about that gaming could be a career option so you know uh, the spending power increases uh, when you have parents backing you so that's the reason i believe that pc uh, could also make it but console we are very far away in my opinion right, so if i were to break it down we're looking at mobile esports as the mass market audience pc right. is slightly niche and then console is the ultra niche side of things um Does anyone have any thoughts around VR and esports? Right? Do, are we? How far away are we from? Cohen, how far away are we from seeing maybe football being played in VR environments rather than just on consoles or on PCs? I, I like that you mentioned virtual reality because that was actually the one I wanted to add, uh, which I didn't hear yet. So I, I fully agree, of course, with with Payal and Animesh. Uh, virtual reality is still relatively expensive, especially for households everywhere across the globe. You know, like you have to buy a PC or or a console, and then additionally, a virtual reality headset. So the costs are quite high. Uh, but maybe in time that will change. But I do think, and I do see uh, trends, uh, and I do believe that it is a form of active esports as as one likes to call it across the globe that is very interesting because it also connects the traditional sports with the esports world let's say through one platform uh, and we've already seen several videos where people in the fighting sports are using like virtual reality and virtual systems uh, to to basically fight each other in a in a virtual world and we have rowing and other things that are going on uh, already swift i think is a very famous one which is um, like bicycling was that uh in in normal you probably know what i mean like on a bicycle and then and then uh, in in virtual reality so there's already a couple of a uh, couple of interesting innovations regarding vr and i do see it growing but only if the costs are reduced because nowadays what we all mentioned already the mobile phone is easily accessible everyone has it throughout the day with them in their pocket uh, you can play dozens of games uh on on those systems uh, it's a lot cheaper than a pc console virtual reality glasses so it has a lot of potential and not to forget that you can always connect a mobile phone to a pc and eventually play on the pc if you want to so uh, i think there's a lot of opportunities with that system but virtual reality should definitely not be underestimated for the future where maybe a game like counter strike or valorant will be played in a in a football stadium where you know you have the walls instead of a, a grass field you just have like a map of of a shooter uh, built inside the stadium uh, with white walls and then you put the virtual reality glasses on and it's it's the map you know you have to run around instead of having a controller even you have to run around uh, with whatever you have in your hands uh, in order to to fight the opponent so it can be great practice for the army as well and in the netherlands they are already testing so it's it's very interesting definitely interesting and, and you know there are some really cool vr experiences out there for watching these sports tournaments today um like you said though as soon as it's affordable and accessible i think we'll see you know a, a landmark shift in the way people consume and create esports content um lokman you mayang would you guys be open to the idea of playing you know getting physically involved while you're competing in esports through a vr device Oh yes, uh, I think I've experienced a, a VR game back in 2019, and it was at an event, and it was related to golf. And I tried playing that game, and it it was actually pretty interesting because uh, I I've never experienced VR before that. And as as Coin said that uh, fighting games like uh, boxing and other other games that required requires a slightly bit of your stamina. can be really good uh, for vr games yeah 
And to add to what Mayank said, actually, I think uh, in all these uh, tournaments, when we actually go there, there's a lot of fun activities going on. For example, at DreamHack, when I visited uh, Mumbai in 2018, and even in the 2019 one that happened in Delhi, there were a lot of activities going on. There was some VR testing going on. And I, I saw a couple of kids who were really excited. Uh, he just went up to uh, his father and he said that I really want to try that out. And he was jumping with uh, the VR headset on his on his there, and he was hitting the ball everywhere, like just to play football, you know, in a virtual reality space. And he said, "I'm enjoying this so much that I I want to do this." And you you see someone just in his imagination, just seeing everything virtually, and just you know playing different kind of games, shooting games. I I, I think that's the way forward for entertainment. Uh, I would like to basically. Um, uh go go back to what animesh said in terms of content even pile for that matter that uh how important it is for the entertain entertainment side of things to come and i think vr is going to add uh, to that not everything is esports within the within the space i think content and esports together is a way to go uh just like teeth also said that you know uh it's difficult to compete in different titles uh, because they might not have the prize money in terms of that but with respect to virtual reality coming there's so many options. There's a variety which I think traditional sports, in in that sense, kind of lacks. And esports has that kind of advantage if, if you actually compare that. Excellent. So we've got about, <clears throat> pardon me, we've got about five minutes before we wrap up the session. I'd like to go around the table once and just ask everyone one simple question: um, What does it take to be a successful content creator, player, or business owner in esports? Colin, maybe we can start with you and move, move to Dilip. Uh, take the risk or lose the chance. That's always the quote I carry with me since a very young age. Look, I'm, I'm one of those people. I do live from the industry full time. I have my own business. Uh, I uh, and this is not an advice, but I gave up my medical study uh, to become a doctor in order to achieve this. But that was not because oh, I just want to be in the industry and uh, forget my study. I already had a lot of things I did besides my study, which eventually gave me the opportunity to work with several businesses that were mentioned at the beginning uh, during my introduction. But if you're a full-time, if you're a full-time student, you can't work with those companies. So I wanted to have the chance, the opportunity. So I uh, I, I stopped my study, and uh, and yeah, that was the beginning. So. I think if you want to be a business owner, if you want to be a player, um, at least a business owner is a lot about building your business next to your study, because I agree with everyone here that says your study should be priority and you can build your business, your career next to your study, uh, because eventually when you start to be good enough and you start to be picked up by bigger organizations, that's the moment you can think, OK, what am I going to do? But until you are not there, study is still number one and, and study is priority. Same with building a business, scale it and build it next to your study and the weekends, early mornings, get up early, work late the typical stories um, so i think that would be uh, would be my my message uh, stick to your study but use all the all the other time you have in order to build your career to reach one of those positions because it is definitely possible and everyone here that is attending this panel as a speaker has proven it excellent there's assuming that you've got your studies and your 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 gaming life in balance right what does it take to push and become that one percent the elite one percent of gamers so i would say like it mostly comes about actively learning and not actively playing more i would say uh, at least for games like strategical games like hearthstone you know we have to focus a lot more on preparation itself and uh, less on the playing the game part uh, i would say so i think that's the main thing that uh, comes to my mind you know having good preparation of the title you are pursuing your uh, esports career in i think that's the main thing and of course apart from that like you have to develop your skills by actively looking at for example, replays of the players that uh, you look up to, things like that. And uh, of course, there's things like dedication that comes into this as well. You know, you have to stick to the good practices that are known uh, and instead of just reinventing the wheel or, uh, you know, doubting the process itself. So that's also one thing. And I think the main thing that essentially prevents a gamer or a competitor, I would say, from being at the top percentile is just taking the initiative. You know, I've seen so many players just hesitant in even participating. They think that, you know, they are not good enough. Uh, they won't be able to win in these international events. And because of that, they just uh, stop competing or stop participating. So I would say like that's the main thing that prevents these players, these hidden talents from being in the top percentile. I think if they just keep on pursuing, keep on continuing to, you know, compete and participate, then 
uh, it's just a matter of time uh, if, if they follow good practices that they reach the top percentile. So persistence and a learning mindset is what we need in, in huge amounts to actually get there. Animesh, once you're in the top 1%, how do you turn this into a successful business or a successful career path for yourself? Uh, I would say, you know, uh... To when you're if you're in the top one person, you're already there. I believe that, especially uh, in India, with the number of people like I've seen, whoever makes it to the the successful lot, they are already making tons of money in India. To be honest, but uh, you know, for people who want to get in, I think you should know what you're getting into. Everyone wants to be a model, or a scout, or a lok pani, or my young or that. But what they don't realize that uh, all of these people, including myself, we had a benefit that we were early movers. We were the uh, people who started this thing, and matlab, we of our uh, journeys could have gone anywhere. But now, if someone want, wants to enter the space, it wasn't easy for us, but it's gonna be way more tougher for them because they have been people who have already established themselves well enough, and there is a barrier of entry in terms of skill uh, and reach, etc. So I would say uh, it's great that you want to be like your idols, but you should know what you're trying to get into and how the process works. I mean, like just getting, uh, obviously, like if you're talking about the very young generation, for them, it, it's just like maybe if I get a good uh, device, if I get a good iPhone, if I get a great PC, I could be a top-notch player. But they don't realize what goes behind becoming a top-notch player. What's the kind of grind that a esports athlete or a content creator needs to do? What sort of struggles we have to go through? I mean, like it's it's a one simple proverb, like saying it's all that glitters is not gold. It's actually not here in esports. I mean, like when I sit with uh, you know my uncle when they enter, they realize they're talking about Hearthstone, how they only just tournaments or only two tournaments that have happened in India till now. Although he represented India, got a bronze medal. So it's very, uh, it's a very you know, uh, uh, it's a sort of industry where you need to have a good understanding before you enter and try to uh, make your way out. So I would say don't just think that uh, you could be at the top. Uh, don't just get influenced by the top. And try to be uh, like them on day one. It's not gonna be possible. It's, it's a big barrier. So just know what you're trying to get into. And but uh, if you're uh, like if you want to join, we will obviously welcome everyone with open arms and try to create as many opportunities for everyone. Excellent. And that's all the time we have for today's panel. It's been a real pleasure having all of you here and discussing this with you. Um, thank you so much for having us here. Said over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Nishant. Expertly moderated and very well kept to time. Uh, plenty of insight, of course, on display there. We started, of course, talking about the journey of esports in India from uh, price pots that uh, were much smaller compared to where they are and hundreds of participants to, of course, where things are at the moment. Uh, Third Mank and Lokpani, of course, contributing there. We then spoke about uh, representing the country being a massive incentive uh, with Animesh uh, chiming in with his thoughts. We then, of course, moved on to Cohen speaking about a journey from uh, 06 back when there was a lot more stigma, but hopefully moving forward, a change in perception, a change in culture perhaps beckons. We then continued, of course, discussing potentially balancing one's passion for a career in esports with something perhaps uh, that's considered safer, potentially to a point where a legitimate option, of course, emerges to go full time in a career with esports. A bit of future gazing, of course, then followed with uh, the advent of 5G, perhaps increased bandwidth and lower latency, could well and truly uh, unlock immersive experiences, including virtual reality, which is where we about concluded this particular panel. So a huge thanks once again to our panelists, Tith, Lokmanu, Mayank, Payal, Animesh, Cohen, and Sylvia, and of course, our moderator, Nishant. I also wanna thank you all for being as candid and as honest as you've been, in addition to, of course, the insights on offer. Our next session will be beginning imminently. This will be a session on a global perspective of the esports industry and how, of course, the Indian and domestic market compares to the one overseas. We'll see you all very shortly indeed.